Yeah, kicking it off, uh, it's this this week's Macro Talk, uh, back with Ben, and we've got a special guest, um, Matthew Pines. Thank you for joining us, sir. Um, dare I say it, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us, and really looking forward to your com commentary and perspective around what's going on in the big bad world of macro, and obviously how it's affecting um you know us little crypto players but obviously significantly and yeah let's kick it off take it away ben all right well uh yeah like uh jedi already said like this is matthew pines and uh he recently got the uh the lynn alden bump on twitter and so uh <laughs> i uh had already been in his dms before that so <laughs> um yeah so just wanted to kick off the discussion matt um I guess a good place to start is you are uh, pretty notorious for being a uh, a Bitcoiner. Your your pinned tweet on Twitter is the uh, is a, a very nice piece that I uh, would recommend everybody go read uh, that you had in Bitcoin Magazine. That um, you know I, I I really wanted to pick your brain I guess on on Bitcoin and kind of like how you see it fitting into the uh you know where we are with dollar hegemony and like what what do you feel that bitcoin offers in a world where sovereign debt is becoming more and more suspect yeah thanks for having me uh, i mean that's that's the uh whatever how many trillion dollar question right um <laughs> so the way i try to start with this is first just try to frame kind of the terms of the question, right? So we're really talking about trying to um, lay out potential alternative monetary regimes for the global system, right? That's that's a very large scale kind of world historical level question. Um, so the first, first sort of proviso is that trying to answer such a question should come with some uh, uncertainty bounds and some intellectual humility. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone has a crystal ball to sort of um, project out with a high degree of confidence how such a um, you know dramatic change to the global order would exactly evolve. So that's just sort of me me setting the terms up front. Um, and Bitcoin, you know, if you just bracket that off aside, if Bitcoin never existed and you were trying to a answer a similar question about the future of the global monetary system in the next 5, 10, 15 years, that would be on its own and in almost impossibly difficult task, right? I mean, that is what hedge funds, heads of state, um, every prognosticator is trying to, to, to look ahead and try to understand the major structural drivers of change and then the conditions under which, you know, a system that's under stress may, may break and, and, and could break in different ways and what the sort of resulting new system would be. When you throw Bitcoin into the mix, that adds an additional layer of complexity. You have to add a whole bunch of other auxiliary assumptions to your analysis to try to paint um, that type of scenario. So that's me just sort of laying, laying the frame for how I think about it, is that it's not really just a Bitcoin question. There's the Bitcoin element of it. I think you need to look at how Bitcoin has evolved historically. What are the properties of Bitcoin that we see it manifest today? And what are the conditions under which we would expect Bitcoin's continued adoption and evolution over the next, you know, pick your time scale, 5, 10, 15 years. So that's kind of like the endogenous part of that question, just looking at Bitcoin, looking at the properties of Bitcoin as a monetary asset and how that uh, that that monetary asset and the associated network, would, you know, could evolve under appropriate conditions over the next five or 10 years. That's like half of the question. The other half of the question yeah. is how we think the global geopolitical order could evolve and what are they then what are they going to be potential interactions between those two kind of the exogenous side and the endogenous side so that's and that, yeah that's, that's that's the part i definitely want to get your your yeah. pick your brain on because i i probably was neglected in mentioning this but like your 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 background is in like geopolitical kind of war gaming right um yeah so i spent um 10 plus years as a consultant for the government uh mostly on the national security and homeland security side where i did a lot of things uh, as a consultant you work on a lot of different projects but kind of the through line through that 10 years of work was basically looking at sort of low probability high consequence scenarios uh whether it's natural hazards as well as man-made you know hazards like terrorist events nuclear war cyber attacks etc mm -hmm. so i did a lot of sort of um exercises sort of war games sort of scenario analysis as well as um 
uh, more sort of like quantitative and sort of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of program assessments and policy assessments. Um, I also did, you know, various assessments of emerging technology for the government. So looking ahead and trying to figure out where emerging technology could help meet kind of different um, sort of government uh, kind of requirements um, and do assessments of those technologies. So that was like 10 years of, of my job. I did a lot of cybersecurity work as well. In the last six months or so, I've shifted entirely to the private sector. So I work for a consultancy um, called the Krebs Stamos Group that um, we do uh, geopolitical and cybersecurity uh, sort of risk analysis and strategic advisor support to uh, private companies. Uh, a lot of multinationals that are facing increasing geopolitical risks uh, so having to de-risk their you know, operations, say, in China, getting out of Russia, or uh, posturing their own internal security programs to increasing threats that come from you know, threat actors trying to get their IP, um, et cetera. So we do a lot of work um, with companies to sort of up, up their, um, their security game across a lot of different dimensions. But we really integrate kind of the geopolitical insights with sort of technical cybersecurity expertise and kind of strategic um, kind of leadership executive level kind of um, advisory support. So that's like my day job. <laughs> Bitcoin and this sort of geopolitical uh, sort of stuff on Twitter is kind of a side hobby. That's like my intellectual interest. This um, is my side hobby too, so yeah. that's okay. <laughs> so so obviously in the day to day, right, you're solving a particular company's problems really in sort of in the, in the gears of the global machine. And you sort of, you know, there you're looking at more tactical sorts of questions. Where I try to look, you know, in the, in the Bitcoin angle here and larger sort of geostrategic questions are much more you say macro kind of lo lo larger kind of strategic level questions. Um, and so I think there's an interplay between those two because often, you know, those increasing risks that we see at the strategic level play out, um, you know, firm by firm. Um, but yeah, so that's, yeah, so I can, I can, I can further elaborate on the, on, on the, yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to get to all of that because um, there's all of that stuff kind of is fitting together now in crazy ways. And, I have to imagine your work is very busy now with uh, all of the various uh, geopolitical uh, happenings and goings on right now. Um, so I think before we touch back, I, I do want to circle back to the Bitcoin thing, mm -hmm. but I think maybe a, a better place to start would be like just kind of painting the picture of global liquidity and global uh, where the monetary system is right now. And then we can kind of circle back to, to the Bitcoin because I think that that whole discussion will inform kind of how the game theory of, of the way this plays out um, works. And uh, I actually wanted to, I wanted to share a link that, uh, or show um, a, let's see, it was one of the posts that you had the other day that this, this picture right here, um, because I, I thought this was very good. I'm not. I'm not sure if you made this uh, yourself or. Um, yeah, yeah. I uh, I just threw that together in PowerPoint. That's what a consultant does, man. That's what yeah. Make the, uh, this is a very very good like well well developed picture because like I I really think that this kind of like outlays the the whole issue that we have seen over the last um, like basically since the global financial crisis, right? Like we've seen this tendency to move away from uh, expanding bank balance sheets domestically. And instead, we've basically, every time the Fed does QE, they kind of push all of the, the, those reserves and all that money creation, they push it out in the global dollar system. And then it ends up like all of the, the, the money creation aspect of uh, the dollar system has been basically pushed off into uh, repo and forms of uh, collateral um, lending. And so you just get this um, very, um, you, you get this system that's super reflexive and just kind of, it, it, it spins itself up with a bunch of leverage and then it washes all back out again. And like, I guess I wanted to get your take on, on that and whether my description <laughs> resonates with you there. Yes. So, uh, you know, the current monetary system, if you think about what a dollar is, it's a balance sheet entry. And so essentially you can think, I think of sort of the global financial system in terms of balance sheets 
and in terms of the relative expansion or contraction of those balance sheets. It's like these are capacitors and they're charging up or charging down, they're shrinking or expanding. And that sort of is almost ontologically what we mean when we say liquidity is expanding or liquidity is contracting. And the sort of the um, intermediation between those balance sheets in the modern sort of global financial system is repo, right? Is collateral, right? Is, you know, how people are willing to expand their balance sheet, right? In, in terms of giving a money like asset as a liability requires a piece of collateral that they trust that that's, that's posted by someone who's willing to, you know, engage in some other um, sort of uh, sort of funding transaction. And that's basically how money works in the modern system. Ultimately it all traces back to the Fed's balance sheet as the lender of last resort. <clears throat> and that's basically the history of kind of the post-crisis era is the Fed um, essentially being the backstop ultimately for this offshore global euro dollar system, which is driven by animal spirits, right? People's confidence in their counterparties and their confidence in the future and be willing to expand their balance sheets, which is creating more money, which is creating more obligations, which in times of optimism and plenty and growth are mutually reinforcing. Everyone gets more confident, balance sheets go up, asset prices go up, everything goes in the right direction. But that's a very fragile system and it's vulnerable to you know these sorts of um feedback loops where as soon as you get a, a loss of confidence in either the future or in your counterparty and those become reciprocally reflexive people start to have increased margin uh requirements which uh basically cause people to uh, you know especially if they're at a critical threshold sell their assets which reduces the price of those assets those assets are posted as collateral when the collateral falls, this is what we saw with Bank of England, right? It's the classic doom loop where yep. selling begets more selling. And that is a contraction of balance sheets. That's a destruction of money. And in a credit-based money system, that can only go on for so long before the basic gears of the economic machine break down. And the function of a central bank in the modern era is to be the lender of last resort to that system to prevent those collateral chains of obligation from completely collapsing and taking down the whole global economic order. So that is an implicit um, sort of uh, not a monetary dynamic, it's a, it's a power dynamic, it's a dynamic of moral hazard because this sort of offshore shadow banking system isn't effectively regulated by the Fed, like the commercial banking system, like the function nope. of the Fed's existence, uh, uh, you know, when it, when it was started was to establish parity in the onshore dollar system so that a JP Morgan dollar you know, issued in New York was the same as a bank in San Francisco dollar issued in California. And that basically trade and commerce in the United States uh, you know, was sort of greased by that backstop, that guarantee that a dollar, a dollar was a dollar and that, you know, everyone had access to bank reserves ultimately. And if there was a liquidity crisis, the Fed would step in with a discount window, accept collateral and give a, sort of a money like <clears throat> short dated instrument to be able to clear any potential claim. That yeah. global system doesn't have that lender of last resort formally, but the Fed has had to sort of back itself into that role. And it's a very uncomfortable position. Because it's effectively, um, you know, put into this sort of uh, will they, will they, won't they? And the market has to basically constantly test the Fed's, call the Fed's bluff. And ultimately, when push comes to shove, as we saw in March of 2020, the Fed will step in. The Fed has to backstop private money guarantees in order to prevent a total run on the offshore dollar system. Because ultimately, the reason why they really have to do that is not just because the global financial system relies on these um sort of dollar-like instruments that are expanded in, in private um, sort of money issuance overseas, it's because the collateral that um, enables that uh, that money creation is the U.S. Treasury security. And yep. U.S. Treasury security is a critical strategic um, asset of the United States. It is our full faith and credit. It is what the United States um, global superpower, our, 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 our overall economic hegemony relies on, our ability to issue debt effectively at seniorage um, and support, you know, structural persistent rate deficits uh, and, you know, uh, support the roles uh, of the of U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. And so we need to have the U.S. Treasury security be a deep and liquid market that's safe enough oh. to serve that role as global collateral. And, and that's where this sort of um, we're seeing instability emerge in that system is when you structure global dollar creation on U.S. Treasury security collateral. If the collateral isn't good anymore, if, the, if that safe and liquid collateral either isn't safe because it either might be um, sanctioned or seized or dramatically fall in value or it's not liquid enough because of some of the feedback loops from it not being safe, but also because 
uh, balance sheets are, 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 are constraining, and there's just not enough room to intermediate all the treasury activity that you would want. And that is like a nonlinear process. It's not like a, a simple line that goes down and then you can sort of project it forward. It's a highly nonlinear dynamic system that has um, sort of unknown, but very <laughs> sort of um, uh, reliable in terms of you could expect them to hit some point sort of critical thresholds, right? You, you sort of boil water from 99 degrees to 100, you see a, a phase transition. You see a, a, a qualitative change in the nature of the behavior of the system when it passes some critical threshold. And that is really what we have to look at when a, we see a financial market and any financial market, US Treasury securities are one of are the most strategically critical such market. <clears throat> there are those phase transitions. There are those critical points where if you stress the system, if you drive the system to a certain extreme state, you should expect it to break down. You just don't know where. You don't know how. You don't know exactly when. But that's what yep. you should expect. You're going to drive the system past its its sort of self-stabilizing point. So that was the the, the point of that graph, uh, the kind of those two comparisons, because folks oftentimes confuse the two different um, functions of the dollar sure. and the treasury security and the different okay. dynamics at play. And basically, the U.S. dollar is a global reserve currency, which means it serves as a useful medium of exchange and unit of account that has a network effect. Everyone prices their goods in global trade in dollars, derivatives and swaps, interest rate floors, and all these financial products are priced in dollars. So it makes sense to keep pricing things in dollars because everyone else prices things in dollars. It's a social network everyone wants to be a part of. That's a relatively stable, mutually reinforcing equilibrium <clears throat> where everyone agrees to use this medium of account and unit of, uh, uh, unit of account and medium of exchange to, uh, to transact. That's a completely separate sort of um, system dynamic than the U.S. Treasury security, which has been sort of fused to the to the to the stol, uh, status of the U.S. dollar in the last 50 years. Um, but the U.S. Treasury security is a very different dynamic. It's I would call it a metastable equilibrium. A metastable uh, equilibrium. Like there's there's a regime where it's self balancing, and part of that's regulatory, right? Like the the government will step in and will basically incentivize people to buy it. Also, just when the price of something falls enough, people want to buy it. And so that tends to increase marginal demand for it. And so it keeps it sort of in this like cup. Um, but what I sort of point to is that is that is a if you zoomed in really far to the top of that of that graphic, it would look like the left chart. It would look like a stable equilibrium. My point is that you should zoom further out and you'll see for the US Treasury security, there's a like it's not a it's not a cup that goes all the way up. The, the walls don't go that high. And the question is when it goes past a certain point in terms of stress. The, the dynamic flips. And instead of it becoming a mutually reinforcing dynamic that keeps things at a certain equilibrium, right? Demand eventually goes up when the price falls. It flips to the opposite direction where selling begets more selling because of its role as rehypothecated collateral. And that's basically like the my thesis for the global monetary system in a nutshell is people often look to the strength of the US dollar as a symptom or a proxy for US national, national strength or weakness, depending on what, what, what the move, direction of the move is. Um, but that is a different thing than U.S. Treasury Securities uh, role as global funding collateral and how that's a very different dynamic that makes us sort of more acutely vulnerable in a global system where our adversaries know that's a vulnerability and that's a and that gets into the geopolitical uh, sort of aspect of this. But that's my thesis about treasuries and money. And yep, uh, we're, we're 100 percent aligned on all of that. Like the the thing that strikes me as odd about the whole like Basel three like requirement that everything that we deem as like needing to be safe and a good place to, to store people's money, things like money market funds and stuff, we always demand that they're backed by U.S. Treasuries because it's deep and liquid. But the problem with that is that like you're essentially forcing all of the world to kind of adopt the same risk framework to operate in. And so you're, you're essentially putting everybody into the same side of a trade, right? And like, there's no way you, you remove the ability of people to hedge that, that like U S treasury uh, weakness that it, it, you're showing in your chart, like where, it gets to that instable zone and like there's nothing anybody can do to protect themselves. And it, the only option is for the fed to QE infinity and just pump a bunch of reserves out there in return for, for treasuries. And it, it, it just, 
makes for a very, very vulnerable system. And uh, it, it all seems to be derived from the fact that, like, like you said, we're, we're exporting treasuries instead of actual dollars. And then you've got this whole shadow system that isn't regulated. And so all of the, you know, it, it's cheaper to create money overseas than it is in the U.S. where the actual dollars exist the, or the base, the basest form of money, which is the, the federal reserve, uh, you know, deposits. So, yeah. 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 I mean, the one point I'll add to that is when we think about, so these, the treasury security is, um, held by a lot of different institutions and, uh, it's held by sort of the folks that have to hold it, that are forced to hold it. Right. Because of say Basel three regulations, um, or other mandates that may be imposed on them as a, as a financial institution. And basically they're forced buyers, but they have only so much balance sheet capacity. So that's like one private sector kind of, you know, bucket. Then there's the foreign official sector, right? So sovereign wealth funds, central banks, um, and affiliated sort of um, institutions of, of, of nation states. And those are the other big driver. And so basically that's all that really matters, right? And then there's the Fed, right? Um, and it's like, so if you think about, is that too many actors, right? In the system, maybe, you know, maybe, a few hundred that really matter, right? And so to a certain extent, like the Treasury Department knows all of those, right? And knows intimately, and we collect a lot of intelligence on what their decision making might be. So like US government, like very is finely tuned, you know, it's like one of their principal objectives is to try to track what are the intentions of all those different balance sheets? Are they gonna be willing to accept more of these things that we want to sell them, right? Uh, and and there's, there's, you know, instruments of national power, right? It's not a game in a vacuum, right? It's not a pure free market. This is geopolitics, it's power politics, right? And there's there's horse trading and there's um, there's other considerations. Like the Japanese government isn't just making a decision in a vacuum about the value of the yen and, and be able to support um, you know, uh, the, the yield curve control. The Japanese government is effectively now, um, you know, kind of a quasi member of NATO, right? Like they sort of went to the NATO meeting earlier this year. They are looking at an aggressive China they are, you know, have to militarize. We have lots of bases and they're a strategic ally uh, in the you know, strategic competition against China. And so decisions made by the Japanese monetary um, and government authorities aren't just in a vacuum, right? They always have a geopolitical nexus and decisions made by the Fed, as much as they wouldn't say, always have a geopolitical nexus. Who gets swap lines and who doesn't? So this isn't just a pure market of, okay, there's this offshore dollar system and there's, you know, there's people looking for the clearing price. There's lots of things, lots of pressure that can be made on the market to keep it from clearing. That's the whole point is that what we see with Bank of England as an example is that when the central one, that when the government doesn't have as much political authority or power to enforce the clearing price that they want, the market drives it really out of their out of that domain and that's the test of power that's when a developed market becomes more like an emerging market right yeah uh, and so that's the dynamic at play here is it's a power dynamic it's who can force a clearing price that's politically acceptable that's geopolitically acceptable and who and who can't and then what are the costs of doing that like those there's no free lunch so yep. using your power in a way to enforce a clearing price that's that you control that takes capital it takes political capital it takes you political capital and it can only be done for so long and if yep. external and if other actors know that you have a pain point right that you rely on cheap energy say and you're the europeans right that and you have this trade the, the transmission protection instrument to try to keep the spread clo not close the spreads between german and italian bonds well that's you're putting a target and you're saying to our to, to your geopolitical adversaries here's my vulnerability i need to keep you know subsidizing essentially the, the bond market here, and that's going to require me running, um, you know, like QE. Uh, yeah. But uh, if I don't get my energy, my my power bills go go up 10, 15, 20% a month. And at a certain point, people start revolting. And then I have to give up on that, that, that monetary objective. Um, and so that is the fundamental crisis that we face right now is that yep. we've never really been in a situation globally where um, all all these major instruments of, 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 of kind of geopolitical and monetary um, stability, which were sort of locked in a mutually enforcing kind of frenemy mode, are now fighting with each other and aggressively trying to use their respective um, sources of power to defeat the other. Uh, and so you, 
which you should expect is global instability. Is <laughs> and that's what it is. Um, did you and, see? Yeah. Did you see the statement that Christine Lagarde put out um, about an hour ago, where she said that central banks need to essentially negotiate with one another? Um, she knows. <laughs> they know. <laughs> that oh, sounds yeah. like somebody who's like negotiating from a, uh, a position of weakness, though. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's, please, it just speaks. Please, it, it speaks exactly what. It's exactly what Matt's saying is that there is this friction. There is this. Yeah. This disparity that is existing between the big players and the biggest yep. player is the US dollar, and it's. I would also but, argue my... that we we saw that that same thing play out with the Fed too, where like I've always said that like the Fed is in charge of interest rates until they're not, and then like what happens is like what happened in in March of 2020 where. Basically, the primary dealers stepped aside and said, I'm not market making this. j Powell, it's your move. And then at that point, the Fed had no choice but to, to step in. And at that point, they were no longer in charge of their own destiny. It was, it was now a matter of, of uh, you know, life or death of their, their monetary order, whether they step in or not. So... Yeah, I mean, these are, you think about the primary dealers and, and other GSIBs as essentially proxies of, of the central bank, right? Like their existence is a charter as a function of the sovereign under whose uh, jurisdiction they operate, right? So when push comes to shove, the sovereign sovereigns, right? And the question, though, is then a question of political legitimacy and political capital, right? Is Okay, you can force like you can, but push. You have to just nationalize them, right? That's what you have to do. You have to, and that's sort of what we did post GFCs. We effectively nationalized the major the major banks. We just you know allowed them to keep you know their profit centers, but we sort of required that they buy treasuries. We require they hold you know you know HQA, um, and you know, and then of course if they ever run into trouble, they know you know because they're GSIBs, they're going to get they're going to get a backstop. Um, but that's the political economy of this whole thing, right? The, the the big problem now is that it's not really the major money center banks; it's the offshore um, shadow banks, it's the non-bank financial institutions that haven't you know haven't been brought into that club, right? <laughs> and so sort of, there's a different sort of moral hazard there, right? And that's but, the big problem that the Fed is trying to, you know, they want to kill the shadow banking system to a certain well, extent, right? They want control ultimately over the over the global euro dollar system because. Ultimately, what they have to do is bail it out, but they get none of the control that comes from that, right? What they have to do now is say uh, a French bank or a Swiss bank, whatever, gets in a lot of trouble from making a whole bunch of, you know, dollar loans that that now go bad and they go to their central bank for dollar liquidity. Well, guess what? That central bank comes to the Fed and gets a swap, right? So ultimately, this offshore dollar system requires Fed liquidity. It just has to waterfall through. But the Fed knows that, but it's like they're coming in at the fire. They're coming in with just the fire and spraying liquidity, and you know, like any politician, you want more control. You don't want to have to do that after the fact and play cleanup. You want to be able to control and tighten global dollar leverage, right? And a lot of this is coming through with some of the proposed regulations for central clearing of U.S. Treasuries, where like to try to base and also try to kill what is now basically collateral transformation in that shadow banking system where you have asset backed securities that you know, function like money, right? When times are good, right? It's like, Hey, give me the piece of crap and I'll, you know, securitize it and I'll sell the mezzanines over here that have an implicit fed putt. And then I'll basically be able to um, pass along the risk and, you know, everyone's happy and everyone's just printing money literally. Um, but that system works only when there is that fed put. And the Fed is now basically trying to play bad cop and say, no, that doesn't exist anymore and effectively destroy all those asset backed securities markets and destroy the basic engine of collateral transformation, um, which is risking global depression. Right. I mean, that's right. What, because absolutely. That, that's, that's what you have to risk. You have to say, I'm willing to let it burn. I have to be the joker and light the whole thing on fire to control <laughs> the moral hazard that let this whole system metastasize in the first place. And, I mean, and yeah, and that's, that's where that's where CBDC step in because that's what they ultimately want. They want to be able to issue a global dollar to the entire world that is digital in nature that they can actually control, rather than relying on on collateral 
decentralized lending for monetary creation, a CBDC now allows them to, to try to actually exert that control in the offshore system and, and kind of bring those, those uh, shadow banks I I under heel, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, Swift just announced that, you know, a lot of the sort of um, financial rails, right. They're trying to make compatible for cross bridging CBDCs in kind of a friendly, you know, G7 friendly um, <laughs> where you can see, you know, just different, different monetary networks competing, right. The sort of Chinese uh, what's called the DCEP, the digital currency electronic payment system, which is their sort of technical uh, infrastructure for the digital yuan. They're trying to roll out there and that goes with the SIPs, which is the, uh, the Chinese kind of like alternative to, to SWIFT. Um, it's actually more than, than, than SWIFT because it actually allows um, uh, clearance. So it's kind of like a Fed wire as well. Um, so China is trying to implement uh, a, you know, a nascent regime. I mean, they have bilateral swaps with like most countries in the world. Um, and, you know, this is a system they're trying to you know, internationalize. Uh, that is... That is what they're trying to push, right? And the U.S. is trying to push essentially SWIFT plus cross-bridge CBDC mutual compatibility to be able to provide a safe asset to the world that doesn't rely on putting U.S. treasury securities in this highly unstable collateral chain um, and sort of instead say, all right, you want credit emerging market? Well, we basically have an algorithm that decides <laughs> whether you get uh, more CBDCs allocated to you, right? More, more, more dollar CBDCs allocated to you. Um, and that's, that's a big fight basically, because well, not, that, that international piece, which I think is you're right to point out is really, I think the true objective of a dollar CBDC is now being, you know, obviously most people are focused on the domestic implications as like a, as a surveillance, um, uh, Kind of social credit system right that people don't want to have you know their fed uh you know account be subject to and the fed doesn't want to have to manage that either right like no they you know, don't you know they don't called call congress so this is where like the dollar stable coins come in right it's like an interesting kind of phenomenon that i think a lot of folks are looking at and that's well, i think where you're going to see kind of this weird hybrid system potentially evolve yeah and to that point, though, like one of the things that I think never seems to get discussed in this is that the the dollar became such a dominant global currency, not only just because we had all the gold after World War One and two, like that, that was also part of it. But like it was a decentralized system that I mean, that freedom allowed by that system allowed it to flourish. And all of the talks of CD, CBDCs that I've seen are kind of about clamping down on control. And, and, it's, it, it, and that especially goes for China. Like, there is, there is no sovereign entity I know of that is clamoring more for that control than China. And, like, I think ultimately the CBDC that is going to win this battle is the one that gives up the control because... I think that's why you've seen so much innovation in crypto, so much innovation uh, in the, I mean, just in the global Euro dollar system too, over the last 50 years, like is because it's had the freedom to operate that way. Mm -hmm. And when you start trying to clamp down on things, money is kind of like water. It just flows to where that freedom, where that freedom is. And, and any, any attempts to like exert control on it are sort of like entropy. Like you can reduce it locally, but it's, it's always increasing globally. And that's why you've got like these huge money centers in like the Caymans and Lombard street where places where the, the regulatory arbitrage just pushes that, that, that money over there. And so like, I, I don't know if we have the, the political restraint to be able to say, here's a CBDC that we could use to exert control over everyone in the world, but we're not going to do it. Yeah, I mean, there's a few there's a few aspects of that. One is that just if you look at just sort of the evolution of the 20th century in terms of the global system, you know, the clear trends have been towards more what you might call global coordination, global cooperation. You could like like a lots of different domains, whether it's like regulation of like spectrum 
uh, like uh, like airplane safety, internet protocol regulation. Like it's it's a it's a objective fact that like global decision makers like all communicate and coordinate to try to get the same sorts of regulations, the same sorts of um, sort of policies. And, you know, it's the exceptions that usually generate the most attention, like the rogue states or like, you know, the, the revanchist powers who want to challenge that order. But the trend has been we want to have basically the same rules globally, right? That's what people like in, uh, in leadership positions for decades have been trying to, to, to instantiate. Um, that's just like an objective fact, right? The question is, will that continue, right? But that is a strong and durable trend. And you should expect it to continue unless it's broken somehow, right? And I think the CBDC is a natural, you know, uh, example of that, right? You see the Bank of National Settlements and the IMF and everyone putting out position papers and saying, this is a thing we need to do and develop pilot programs. And so it's like, okay, that's that's a clear sort of global coordinating objective that a lot of, of, of leaders around the world have set for themselves. And unless something happens, it's likely it's likely to, 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 to manifest. Now, how exactly it gets, it gets uh, unfolded and, and implemented, Hold a whole different question, but the key question that I have is that sort of um, regime of global coordination. Ultimately, and this is like the sort of traditional, uh, like international relations theory, right, requires a global hegemon who's there to essentially be the rule giver, and then everyone else is a rule taker, right? And that no one questions the power center, and that effectively provides an umbrella for that coordination to occur. Right. That's what a function of a global hegemon really does to uh, enable global coordination is, you know, reduces, you know, the cost to cooperate because the costs of fighting are so high because the global hegemon will just smack smack any any defector out of that bargaining agreement. Um, the big problem is that when you don't have that global hegemon anymore, right, then that system starts to break down and then you get defections. Then those defections get rewarded. Right. And they have their own spheres of influence. And that's Really, I think what you're seeing now is the main power hegemon trying to knock down defections, right? And, and, and trying to make an example for any potential defectors of the cost of defecting from this global coordinating regime. That's, you know, ultimately how I sort of view the Ukraine situation is, you know, obviously Putin invaded, like that was the objective fact of the matter. But the geopolitical context is Russia is trying to challenge the geopolitical um, balance of power arrangement. And they have a strategic partnership with China who has a very similar objective. And there's a whole sort of uh, swath of governments around the world. You can look at the sort of Eurasian axis of, of authoritarian systems, basically, that um, have control over a huge chunk of the, global, of the global commodity and energy capacity, as well as global production. And they want to leverage that power to try to change the rules, right? Try to ch uh, challenge the existing status quo power arrangement. And that, that, is the, that is the major test right now, right? We sort of cloak it in lots of different verbiage, whether it's you know, the, you know, the, the fight for freedom in Ukraine or whether it's Taiwanian uh, sort of sovereignty. But ultimately, it's uh, strategic competition, balance of power, you know, going back to like 19th century uh, or even early 20th century, uh, you know, international dynamics. And so the monetary dynamic is, is, has to be layered in there, right? Like the success or failure of a dollar CBDC isn't just going to be the sort of technocratic do they get the right contractor to build the servers, right? It's like, well, they got to do that too. And that's a whole different question about, you know, how effective we are at building the sorts of technical systems and not having them be hacked or pwned. Um, uh, but then it's just the global contest for who's going to be able to set the rules in what sphere of influence. And ultimately, you know, these sorts of, you know, the big problem that I see is that when you have this much stress, when you have rising states trying to challenge uh, the sort of incumbent geopolitical order, Typically, that results in world wars. That results in big major power conflicts. Like, no one just says, oh, like, I lost that small proxy war. I'm going to, you know, give up and, you know, like, you know, kind of uh, cede to, 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 your, to, your, to your whim. You, you keep going. And you, you fight until you, until you decisively lose. And there needs to be a decisive conflict. And that's really dangerous in a world with, you know, nuclear weapons. So, so. That kind of brings uh, brings me to the next point that I kind of wanted to hit on is the the Fed raising rates right now. I guess what what percentage of of that decision making do you think has to do with breaking these challengers in a monetary function uh, versus like just yes we're trying to control inflation, mm -hmm. but it also seems like. Part of this is 
we are exerting control on the price of money because the history of war is also the history of war finance. And if you don't have the ability to finance your war, your war is going to have a bad time. <laughs> so, yep. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. Is that like, do you see that as, as being a, a part of, of what's going on here with the Fed? Certainly. I mean, it's not just the raising of, of the rates, right? I look at the whole suite of, 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 um, what I would call sort of uh, instruments of economic warfare that we're deploying, right? And so we're deploying them against our two major challenger adversaries, Russia and China, in different ways because the uh, uh, degree of acuteness of that of the respective conflicts is different. Um, so our like our, our our measures of intensity of executing economic warfare are associatedly different. Um, but that's what's happening, right? Like. The U.S. and whether G7 allies, essentially, which are just extensions of our geopolitical um, bloc, are weaponizing what what is our major power center, which is the marginal control over credit and the price of the price of money, price of a dollar that denominates all other global trade mostly. Um, uh, and so that's what we're weaponizing, right? That's our major tool, instrument of national power, and we're weaponizing it a lot of different ways. We're weaponizing it, you know, most objectively through like sanctions on Russia, right? Where we basically just said. You can't have your money anymore, right? Like those three hundred billion dollars of of sovereign reserves, we're just going to freeze them. We're just going to say those aren't yours anymore, right? That is the purest expression of 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 of, of weaponizing money, right? Um, then the whole history of like traditional OFAC designations, right? Putting folks on the, the the SDN list, you know, blocking access to SWIFT from major Russian financial institutions, um, you know, seizing people's boats and properties, you know, in the south of France, etc. That is Sanctions power, economic warfare, like par excellence. That is like that is us weaponizing our major instrument of national power. The Fed, I'd say, is a piece of that because what they're doing is they're making uh, more the dollar system strain folks that have high dollar debt. Now that's not really the weapon against against Russia. Russia doesn't really care what the Fed's doing. Um, it is kind of a weapon against China to a certain extent. Um, and there is currency war going on, it, it, you know, with China, basically, or you could say it's a currency war, it's a trade war, it's a cyber war, um, and it's creeping up the ladder to like true economic warfare, right? With things like, uh, like the recent executive order, basically uh, heavily restricting the sale of advanced semiconductors and re related technology to China. Like we're trying to choke them off from the key economic inputs that you require to make them on an uh, industrial technological um, uh, uh, economy, which is sort of, you know, we did to Japan, like in the, the pre-World War II era, right? Like effective economic warfare, the same thing that, that Great Britain did to Germany. Um, uh, when you see a rising challenger who's getting stronger, right? What you do is you try to like cut the legs off from their rising strength, right? And that's usually seen by the adversary as like essentially like an escalation, Right. Even yep. if the incumbent power sees it as like a measure sort of sort of war. Right. That needs to happen to sort of forestall war. But this is the feedback dynamic that that generates. And so, yes, we are weaponizing the the dollar and in, in, in the sort of the, the, the China phase of that. That's where I think the Fed's actions are a little bit more relevant. Um, and it's not just the Fed as the Treasury. You know, there's whispers that like, you know, the devaluation of, of, of the yen and all the other East Asian currencies is putting a lot of pressure intentionally on the yuan peg the chinese have massive internal debts right and so putting a lot of pressure on them when they're acutely vulnerable is you know is one weapon here right and, and it we're trying definitely to, is we're trying to basically force inflation into china china's trying to force inflation back to us so far they're winning right i mean basically if you look at the charts like the chinese average cost of living is like below where it was last year where the u.s is like 10 15 well I guess how much of that, how much of that is the the deflationary bust of of all of their you know lending markets uh, mm -hmm. in real estate and whatnot blowing up over there? Like, I mean, that is that is inherently deflationary. And COVID and then, zero. Yeah. And and COVID zero. And and like, so, like, I I I don't know that that's inflation is the is the greater of two evils there. Mm -hmm. where you've got massive deleveraging happening. And, and, and I think some of that has to do with the capital controls that China has, has put in place over the years. Like, and so like they have this sort of like monetary border drawn around themselves that when they got all these dollars and stuff from overseas, from exports and stuff, like all that money kind of just stayed 
in China and just got levered up and levered up and levered up. And there's all these like various ways that um, like they don't have the same like level of like financial regulation that we do. Um, I think there's there's a lot of like hidden leverage in that system of theirs that is just currently unwinding in a very slow motion train wreck right now. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of local governments basically finance um, through off balance sheet special purpose vehicles and through sort of crony relationships with like local banks. <clears throat> and there's about ninety trillion dollars of total housing, uh, you know, um, debt. In in uh, in China, about 30, 33 trillion dollars worth of deposits. Um, they basically need to do a controlled demolition of that ninety trillion. You know, cut off <laughs> just ninety trillion? trillion. What's 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 ninety yeah. trillion? I mean, it's price. an internal political economy question because the the the, the national government's balance sheet is pretty healthy. I think it's like thirty percent debt GDP. I could have that wrong, but it's very low, right? Whereas the sort of local governments and the these sort of off balance sheet debt loads are enormous. And so it's a question of you know. Ultimately, the central bank can assume those debts, but like in China, it's a very complicated internal political economy of who takes the pain, what are the consequences of, of, of distributing that pain, and the CCP, right, is a political mafia, right, and there's factions, and certain parts of the country, right, are not allied with that. There's the Shanghai clique, those oligarchs who she is trying to crush, basically, with lockdowns and asset seizures, etc. So he's not exactly too like willing to just bail out a whole bunch of local uh, governments. Um, and there's a massive sort of information um, uh, sort of consumption pr problem, right? Like everyone lies to their boss and then the people at, in the central government really have no clue what's going on. Um, so anyways, that's like a whole China thing. The bottom line is there is this currency war happening uh, and you're seeing it play out instead of, uh, you know, like, yeah, like the, the, the interest rates moves globally, which are a response to, inflation like that's actually you know true um they do have this geopolitical element right and and like uh, a major you know reserve currency like the yen doesn't devalue by like whatever it is now 25 percent saying like 147 today uh it doesn't happen without the treasury department like saying that's okay right like like when the thai did it when the you know when the thai bought it, it was like we're your currency manipulator and like we're gonna we're gonna take you to task you know in dc whatever right like if the treasury department doesn't like how another nation's currency is moving, they they will say so, and they can probably make it move the other direction. So the fact that that hasn't happened with the yen means we're fine with that, right? We want this to happen. Uh, and same thing with the yuan, same thing with um, with uh, with other Asian currencies. Like, yeah, like they're selling a little bit of reserves. Um, if it gets disorderly, it could be a problem because that has a feedback loop to US asset markets and US, and US treasury security. Um, and that's the problem they're facing now. It's like, oh, this is great. But at a certain point, right, like that starts to boomerang back on you, right? It starts to mean you get disorderly conditions in the U.S. Treasury security market and you get like gapping of yields. And that is like that is a uh, stage five uh, alarm for, for the Fed and the Treasury market. So they're in this kind of game, right? Like you, when you go on that on that edge, when you when you really try to you know push power against power, you know, you're you're going to have to. It's not, there's no free lunch, right? You're going to have to accept some pain. And it's a matter of who's willing to take the most pain, who's who whose system can absorb more disorder and more stress that's basically what this amounts to is like we're trying to push a lot of stress on, onto the chinese system onto the russian system they're trying to push a lot of stress into the european system into the u.s associated system and it's like whose system can take the most pain like and then which political system can keep you know their populations from you know revolting essentially when the pain gets too high i mean that's that's also how these systems of of, of um power when they're when they're in a major you know confrontation with each other like who wins who loses and ultimately when it, when when those sort of technocratic kind of like like hybrid warfare when that sort of fails to achieve anyone's strategic objectives then they just start blowing real stuff up right that's basically what happens um that's what the story of russia was like a lot of gray zone hybrid warfare cyber attacks espionage you know like this sort of you know uh, gas oh are we will they won't they turn it up turn it down like that's the hybrid warfare kind of like sub-threshold conflict. And then ultimately, when that doesn't, you know, seem to be meeting anyone's objectives, they just start blowing stuff up, right? And that's that's the history of humanity. Matt, from a market perspective, we always hear, you know, the cliche, this time it's different. But it seems like, you know, obviously being the idiot in the room here, it's, it seems like this is different in many ways. I mean, it, it has the past demonstrated 
a level of monetary warfare to the extent that we're seeing right now? I guess this is very different from my perspective from anything in the past, just because the, the combination of having gone through this pendulum of maximal globalization to like COVID and then like almost all out, like we probably would be yeah. fighting World War Three if we didn't have nukes right now. Like that's like the level of like global strategic co confrontations. Like it's like, the, but it's being held back because everyone has this existential threat, right? The reason why like World War One happened like very quickly is because we didn't have nukes and it was just like, it's go time, right? Um, but you had a similar <laughs> buildup, you had a similar buildup of international, um, stresses and you had this sort of similar pattern of rising powers you know and this sort of doom loop um uh of like you know uh, ratcheting uh, uh suspicion and then counter reaction by you know say the british and the germans and the french thrown in there as well uh and there was economic warfare you know there was blockades there was like essentially the equivalent of sanctions at the time there, you know, and actually were pretty dramatic. Like lots of people actually died. There's like, you know, famines and, you know, there was like food crises in, 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 the, in the, in the rest of the world, you know, like wheat, you know, being coming out of, coming out of, uh, of India was like a strategic thing. And like, I think it was a uh, John Maynard Keynes. It was like tasked with running a secret unit to like manipulate the price of wheat coming out of, um, coming out of India. Um, so that it wouldn't blow up basically the British economy. Right? Uh, and so they had this like, you know, like similar sorts of attempt to try to control financial flows, commodity flows as part of a uh, sort of a weaponized you know, semi-globalized system that was co confronting, you know, major, major disorder. And then it ended up in World War One, Right. Um, so that's like similar to what we're seeing now. Uh, but we have lots of different things now. We have, you know, different systems. We have globalized dollar systems, massive offshore you know, financial institutions that have huge, you know, liabilities. We have global trade. We have like, like everything is highly leveraged to globalization. And like every little product gets made in 15 different places and requires like inputs from thousands of different workers in cities all over the world. And like, if you don't have global trade, if you don't have that system of supply chains and production, like that, again, like it's a nonlinear thing, right? It just doesn't get made, right? It's not like the, the car is like worse it's like the car doesn't get delivered because it's missing that one component and so that all the supply chain was for nothing if you can't have the you know 100 there right um and that's what we're facing now it's like we didn't really have that before right people lots of standards of living were much lower so you know people's expectations and basic global trade weren't as acutely vulnerable to uh this asymmetric disruption um <clears throat> which we saw with covid and which we're seeing sort of still sort of always royal underneath the surface, right? Um, you get this pendulum swing of inventory glut, supply chain shortages, you know, and then you get this sort of feedback loop where everyone is is scared about the future uncertainty. And so they front load their purchases, which increases the inflation, increases the disorder and changes the, the you know, introduces more pathologies to the economic, uh, you know, at the average economic decision maker in the system. So, yeah, I think this is a little, like quite a bit different. Um, the last point I'll say is, we also have means of power projection that we didn't have before. No, obviously nukes, but other things like um, advanced capabilities that other actors can deploy that are really effective um, sort of quasi strategic capabilities that like lots of governments have. So things like autonomous weapon systems and cyber and even potentially biological weapons in, in the near future that like that changes the game, right? Like if, if anyone can take down a grid, not anyone, but like if folks can, have if you know we can we were a continental power right it was very hard almost impossible to invade and so that just like the reason why we're a superpower basically right because no one can invade us um so we can project power out to the world with our with our with our navy and our space-based platforms but no one can really challenge us but the fact that we now have constructed a global system that uh you know relies on sort of this uh this thing we call the internet <laughs> like that's our economy like most companies exist in the cloud most uh, economic activity requires the internet, requires uh, you know some 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 digital element, uh, and so that makes our adversaries you know realize they can challenge sources of national power and you know have strategic effects on us you know at a distance, right? That closes the geographic distance essentially between actors. You look at a map, you think, oh, this is where the tanks can go, but there's another map which is the fiber connections, which is 
people's open ports, right? Or, or their insiders that click on the link, right? And that is a very different threat surface. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what you're seeing a lot of competition now is in cyber, um, is in space, uh, and is in the economic domain, because that's, that's sort of, um, you know, how people yeah, live their lives is they have to buy stuff. And so that to me is where it's really different is that we have constructed this tightly interlinked global system. Um, and now it's being stressed and strained in unprecedented ways. Um, and it can take a lot of hits and it's self healing up to a point people adapt. I mean, you know, COVID was a good example of that. I think is like it got hit by this massive exogenous shock and it screwed a whole bunch of stuff up and we're still seeing kind of the, the, rever the reverberations of that. But like in the end, like COVID wasn't like a, wasn't that big of a shock, right? Like in terms of total death counts, in terms of, you know, eventually after we got the vaccines, you know, we could kind of like reestablish normal, basic normal patterns of, of, of life. Um, but yeah, that's when you have other systems like that, that takes, uh, or systems that take those sorts of accumulated stressors, you know, like look at Europe, right? Like all it takes is, you know, hitting a key threshold and people will get cold and then they, they vote you out <laughs> and then yeah. they the government and the government makes different decisions and that changes the politics of everything. I guess. So for the optimists in the room, do mm -hmm. you see any potential exit ramps here to de-escalate this situation? Yeah. I mean, again, like I try to think in terms of scenarios, right. And I think, you know, obviously people are peak bearish now because everything seems like maximally uncertain and human beings are naturally risk averse and we don't like uncertainty. And so we tend to, you know, like ascribe that like a really negative balance, but uncertainty just means uncertainty, right? Like lots of um, like positive things could happen, like in that widening aperture, right? Like Putin could get knocked off and then there could be like a new Russia in a few years. Right. And that's kind of the plan, right. Is to basically de-Putinize Russia and just like take their, take their energy. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, also, I mean, that probably that would never work. Right. We kind of, you know, we thought we did that in the nineties with the Harvard boys sending sacks and summers there. Um, turned out like when you privatize the country and a bunch of, you know, Silaviki KGB thugs take it over, they, they're probably not going to be all that liberal. Um, uh, so I'm not yeah. sure how that's going to work, but like, that's a scenario where like the, you know, there's just a peace deal, uh, and, or, you know, a change of government. There's the, the optimist scenario where like, she decides, you know what, I'm short on life and, you know, I want to like make a grand bargain with the Taiwanese and we're going to like. You know, do this grand deal, and we're going to de-escalate, and we're going to have you know a a a new peace, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then like that tail risk that's rising of like a Taiwan war, and then the strategic competition that's going to break globalization between U.S. and China, the premium that's going to be increasingly priced into that 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 comes down. Um, on the monetary dynamic, you could see situations where, yeah, we like clear a bunch of these debts. Uh, we reduce our GDP, uh, our debt to GDP after a few years running high inflation, and then we kind of reestablish a, you know, uh, a, a new a, a new pattern from a lower debt debt ratio, and uh, you know that also enables maybe more fiscal capacity that allows us to smooth over some of our political and social disputes internally. Like these things could happen. I'm not saying they're impossible, um, but they're sort of <laughs> fighting against the trend, right? They're sort of the like you have to get lucky, um, and like a lot of those like in a structural in a system that we have it's like vulnerable to anything breaking like they kind of all have to not break for things to, to continue um or is it just is it that they don't need to break or is it that we need the right things to break we need th their things to break mm -hmm. and not our things to break i think yeah i mean if i put like my baseline yeah i mean i mean china the thing about China is like I, I'm not, I don't subscribe to the view that China is like going to be this global hegemon. Um, is going to like completely supplant the United States. Um, but I actually think they're probably going to peak in power like nowish in the next few years in terms of the military power, in terms of economic power. Um, and so it's really these next few years are like the danger zone. In fact, there's a book called The Danger Zone that has this very thesis that it's China's perception of their own relative peaking that is going to make them. Uh, more of a danger to the global system in the immediate future than in like the 2030s. So if we, if we get to 2030 and we haven't like had a Taiwan war, Russia, the Russia Ukraine situation just like turns into another, you know, demilitarized, you know, frozen conflict. And we sort of, you know, bump, bump, bump our car way our through kind of, you know, inflation with a little bit of defaults, a little bit of bailouts with a little bit of like, you know, 
just accommodation and just general declining, you know, living standards in the West a bit and, you know, implicit wealth transfer from, you know, retiring, dying boomers to, you know, younger generation and, you know, implicit defaults on, you know, social security, Medicare, like if you ship away like a few percentage points on everything and just, you know, spread the pain evenly and do it over a long period of time, I could see, and then you avoid any sort of dramatic geopolitical confrontation between a major power. I could see getting to 2030 and technological innovation still happens. Maybe we figured out some, you know, like big thing on energy that sort of is waiting in the wings. Uh, and then we have like a, a, a new, uh, and then we've got climate change to deal with too. Um, so we got like, you know, that's still a problem, but like you could chip away at some of these structural problems and reduce some of the major tail risks. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's a, there's a decent chance that that happens. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that sounds like a very reasonable sort of base case for, for how this all plays out. Uh, you know, obviously this is sort of a powder keg right now, but like, I think there's a number of things that could keep this from escalating further. And that seems like a very reasonable sort of take on it that we just kind of, bumble through and 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 kind of everybody you know takes I mean, their bite people i mean i actually i mean I, i'm somewhat more cynical like even if we like like i think about the taiwan so scenario a lot like is would we fight over taiwan would we go to war over taiwan and like i'm increasingly thinking we probably won't right we will we will do lots of other things but we will probably not put our aircraft carriers in danger uh and risk you know a nuclear confrontation over taiwan that's just me putting like <clears throat> my, my thumb in the air but like that's the major question like if we can avoid that then i think you get to 2030 without a major you know global blow up right that's like to me the major geopolitical flashpoint ukraine i mean i don't think anyone's going to go to nuclear war of ukraine i could see like the escalation the war of wars you know a bunch of you know stuff is happening now <clears throat> I, I i am worried about that but i also think that's what she, that's what you see People, people basically up in the ante to maximize the bargaining position before coming to the, to the table. Like you always escalate and, you know, increase the tension, the threat just before you're willing to negotiate, right? Because Brings, that's brings how you So yeah, that's, that's what you would expect to see. I would not, you know, like when things look like they're most dicey and most intense is when like the posturing for a negotiated sell is probably the closest, even though that's like counterintuitive. Um, but it's like a high risk because that's also when things can break down and then you can have like escalation even further. So, you know, that's, but that's the point I think we're at in the next few months. Um, if we get through that uh, and avoid a Taiwan war, um, cause I just think people, you know, ultimately like we're not just like farmers that can be just be mobilized with like a single piece of paper and know the source of information and go, go, go fight for your country, right? Like most citizens, even in China, right? There's like the Wolf War Diplomacy that really push a lot of, you know, national um, kind of propaganda, kind of, you know, motivate uh, confrontation potentially. Um, and they probably have enough people that will that will go fight. Um, but the Chinese government, you know, they're, they, they want to be rich and they, they want to have, you know, power. They don't want to get assassinated. Uh, and it's a high risk maneuver going after Taiwan. So, um, it's more likely than not that she would try to go for it in some fashion, but like it's a high risk and, you know, ultimately people are self-interested. Um, like even Putin, you could say like he was just mistaken, right. About his own national power, but it wasn't like a strategic miscalculation. Like if he actually had a functioning army that, that he wasn't like, um, in complete, uh, that he had, like, and we thought he had a functioning army too, right? Like we thought he was going to take Kiev in a few days. Like everyone was wrong. Right. Strategically. Right. About the effectiveness of that operation. But like, if he actually had the military capacity that everyone thought he did, including Western intelligence services and his, obviously his own government, like that would have been, you know, if he had actually taken Kiev and, you know, carved up half the country, that would be a very different situation than what we're in right now. So, you know, this, these things are often one person's, you know, you call it a miscalculation or just the dice didn't roll well for him. And like, that's a pivot point for history. And a lot of these idiosyncratic factors can, can come into play. Um, and yeah, like the monetary dimension there, like this is where like money matters a lot, stable coins matter a lot, but like if the rule blows up, it doesn't matter at all, right? <laughs> um, now that's right. my big case, but that's where I think, um, you know, I know we haven't talked a whole lot about Bitcoin, but like that's, I think for me, the more optimistic scenario is Bitcoin, you know, sort of, just sort of, you know, it's creeping out, like, creeping out slowly in the margin. It goes through its sort of booms and busts and but every sort of, you know, gradual phase of adoption grows a little bit more. Um, and so yeah, that's why I'm looking over the course of this decade, right? Is like 
or by, by 2030, if Bitcoin is like a material percentage of gold's total, total market value, um, or even, you know, equivalent to that, you know, there's people who might call me bearish, but like, that's at least to me, a plausible scenario to analog. That's what, like 10 trillion, I think. If yeah, I, I mean, the, monetary, I think the, the monetary payment for trillion. gold, yeah, the monetary payment for gold is like a little bit less, right? Because some of that's for industrial and jewelry, but yeah, like call around 10 by, by 2030. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be obviously a much larger, you know, growth from here. Um, this, this is a good time to, to transition into this but, part of the discussion. Yeah. So I guess like, it sounds like you're kind of on the same place that I am, where it's like you have this hegemony, right, like of of the U.S. dollar system, but the, the system has become increasingly unstable. And there's Bitcoin sort of does. The opportunity that I think Bitcoin has is the fact that it's a sort of off ramp from that hegemony. And it's also sort of a hedge on sovereign debt. It is because there is no sovereign to Bitcoin, it has, it's like a, I see it as kind of a negative yielding bond where, you know, it has this defined issue and schedule that is, you know, it is increasingly disinflationary, um, but it, it's basically a negative yielding bond that could serve as, as good collateral uh, in, a, in a future world. So like, I, I do see that in a world where everybody is so in, uncertain about the, the future for sovereign debt, that, that becoming a dominant narrative that, that everyone sort of moves towards. Is that, is that how you kind of see this? It, there, there is one, one scenario there. And so just trying to, I, I, hard to describe a probability because I think there's different roles it could play. There could just be like a diversified asset in everyone's portfolio, but it doesn't really have a monetary function. That's like one scenario, right? It just sort of monetizes you know, it appreciates, it doesn't necessarily monetize, right? And it's like, you know, a new asset class that lots of people, uh, you know, diversify into. And then, you know, there's a scenario where it sort of eventually, you know, reaches some saturation equilibrium and it's, you know, maybe appreciates, maybe it depreciates, it goes with the economic cycle, but it, it doesn't fully expand to play a role as global reserve asset collateral, right? In a, you know, kind of a, eventually supplanting US treasury security in that role potentially, right? So there's one scenario thing where it could like cap out. There's this area where it kind of, yeah, it gets to sort of a, a equivalent to gold, right? And then gold is a global sovereign asset, right? Reserve asset. Um, it's not collateralized because we explicitly sort of demonetized it to replace it with the treasury security. But if the treasury security is no longer fit for, fit, fit for purpose, then the global system might have to decide, all right, we find a different form of debt collateral, a different sovereign's debt that we're going to use. And, you know, people throw out like the Chinese debt, right? We'll, we'll use, we we'll use Chinese government debt as, as the new sort of repoable collateral for a new China euro dollar petro, petro yuan system. I'm skeptical that, that would really, you know, succeed at scale. I mean, it could happen in like, you know, on the margin, these things aren't binary, but I don't think they're big enough ultimately, or be powerful enough to play that role as a global provider of that sort of, um, reserve asset uh, collateral and then have to you know run their system that they run right now kind of in reverse right where they're recycling surpluses from the rest of the world like we're recycling everyone's surpluses right now which has a large domestic cost right with the whole dripping dilemma so that's hard for me to see is like someone has to be willing to absorb all those surpluses and you know do that for decades and then you do that and ultimately you get you know political division and you get runaway persistent trade deficits and runaway fiscal deficits and then eventually that becomes uns unsustainable and you got to reset so you could just do that again with someone else's debt for a few decades until they run into the same problems that we're running into and, you know, kick the can in, you know, 50 years. So these things have like, you know, like time, time horizons, but that's like one version where they're just the same basic system, but it sort of finds existing sovereign debt collateral and it finds a way to kind of like, you know, be much more inefficient and much more costly, but, and much lower, lower leverage, much less globalized, much more regionalized. But it's still fundamentally a debt-based, sovereign debt-based system, collateral system. <clears throat> if that system completely breaks, people completely hedge out of that because of other things, like geopolitical things. Like, I don't want to have to hold your liabilities um, because, you know, you may sanction me in the future. I don't want to have all my assets just at your at your whim. Um, so I'm going to shift to sort of an outside money. This is like the Zoltan Posner thesis, right? Uh, yeah. I'm going to shift away from inside money, fiat liability claims, principally of G7 powers, but even, you know, a Chinese fiat claim is still, you know, subject to the whims of the Chinese government, which, you know, you may think geopolitically, OPEC 
as an example of a major commodity exporter who's got lots of surpluses, where do those surpluses go? Right now, they're going into Western assets, and that's because they have historically trusted them. Like the Saudis had a secret account with the Treasury Department for 50 years to hold the Treasury securities. Um, and we're seeing, obviously, the Saudis and the U.S. government are exactly on uh, on good terms right now. So that's a good example of where you might see uh, uh, you know a major supplier of surpluses have to marginally hedge away from an inside money claim, especially a G7 sort of um, dollar-based asset, um, where are they going to go there? Are they going to go into a Chinese asset? I mean, that's they might think that that capital account might be closed now, but marginally more open to them, whereas the Western system is an open capital account, but is more likely to be marginally closed to them. So like the direction of travel is pointing in the direction of Chinese, but right now it's not a very open capital account and not you know a very you know stable financial system. So, well, yeah, and, so that's and, like- and the the demography of the Chinese is not great for, for future, you know, returns on that sort of sovereign investment. So, yeah, which means it's probably not going to be the best option for most people. Right. I mean, you could see okay. like, a marginal hedge. It could have a geopolitical element to it. Right. To like, you know, get arms or, you know, to get to get support. Right. There's it's not purely it's not a, all, the decisions aren't necessarily purely about return. Right. <laughs> it's about, you know, geopolitical alignment and buddies and other backdoor deals. But that's like that's that would be one version of this scenario unfolding where just it's just rebalancing of different inside money claims and, you know, kind of a credit debt sovereign system that's just slightly rebalanced and less efficient and less globalized. There's the other sort of like the Legroman thesis of like gold monetizes. And, you know, the thesis there is commodity exporters have an interest in having a neutral reserve settlement means uh, to denominate really like energy trade principally. And that you let all your currencies float against that neutral reserve asset, gold, and that basically rebalances global trade, um, prevents some of these structural, you know, deficits and surpluses, you know, over time. And you know, that's like going back to like a bank core gold system sort of thing. That's like one option. I don't know how how likely that is, but that's that's one scenario. The other scenario would be like an SDR type system, which I think is very unlikely. That's like I mean, the osis of like global coordination. We all agree we're going to create a synthetic reserve asset and we're all going to have this like bunch of technocrats manage it for us in these international forums. And that's what we're going to use to settle international um, uh, uh, you know, trade and, and, and financial so, practices. Real quick, like what yeah. what I mean, that that to me is sort of the Bancor idea, at least in my head. Like, do you see a difference between like, can you elaborate a little more on the on the difference between like the Luke, Luke Groman theory and like mm-hmm. the. SDR as being like, um, kind yeah, of I more... mean, an SDR, I mean, uh, well, the Luke Roman is, is explicitly about gold and about, I mean, you could create like a synthetic asset that's sort of pegged to gold, but then you're trusting the issuer of that synthetic claim. Um, that that's like, these are degrees of how much international trust and coordination you're assuming is in the system here. Like the pure gold, like on ships and planes to settle, you know, trade balances is like the most anarchic, like, like, you know, left, left bound of like no international cooperation, Interna- no one trusts the IMF and, you know, these, these forms for like agreements just break down. That's like the system where you just need gold, right? The bank core is like a version where there is an international agreement. We're going to create this international, you know, asset that's like defined by treaty and by, you know, protocols and, you know, international bodies and, you know, whatever. Everyone kind of gets together and says, this is what we agree on. And the SDR is like a version of that that we have now um that's like a pure synthetic reserve asset that's issued by a trusted quote unquote you know imf um counterparty that's everyone has international treaties with and that there's this negotiation about like the basket of different currencies in there but it's a purely synthetic fiat asset right it's like yep that would be like the version of like everything kind of stays stable and things is sort of just kind of proceed but say the u.s loses its ability to like keep the treasury security at the reserve asset uh, you know, we sort of, we retrench, we shrink geopolitically, we lose our influence. China's not strong enough. And so the SDR is sort of this, you know, compromise asset that, you know, is I know able- China, China has pushed for the SDR to be yeah. the, the reserve currency for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, for those that don't know, the SDR is, is special drawing rights. It's a, it's a, it's a special, like basically a currency backed by a basket of, of, other currencies yeah right it, yeah 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 so. it's, it's a synthetic sort of just reserve asset right it's just everyone gets basically an account with the imf i don't know exactly how it's technically managed but like 
you know, you get an allotment, you get this many SDRs and you can spend them, you can use them to set up a national, um, like, uh, obligation. So if like the state of, you know, Sri Lanka owes India, right? Like some, something where they have, you know, a, 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 a debt, whatever they can like the, the, the government can assume say a private debt and then pay it off using their SDR. So it is, it's like a, it's a money like asset. Everyone has accounts and they can trade them back and forth. Um, but yeah, geopolitically, that advantage is China relative to the U.S. And there's big fights over the you know allotments of, of, of SDRs. You know how many we're gonna, how many we're like we can print, right? It's like they can print them, right? And um, just you know arguments now that we should print more SDRs and help out the emerging market that's under this dollar stress. But you know it's right now not large enough, and it's not used to you know meaningfully denominate global trade or financial flows. It's like right. a sovereign to sovereign kind of thing, mostly for the emerging markets and just to kind of keep things kind of somewhat internationalized. The other alternative would be like that plus CBDCs. So like an ESDR, right? So like that's that's like on the drawing board potentially of like that would be turning an SDR from this sort of pure sovereign level settlement to potentially more of like a, you know, global settlement, right? For, for, for corporations, for potentially even individuals. But you could see it kind of going on the the waterfall of, of entities that would use such an asset to denominate uh, their trade and their financial transactions and to settle uh, to settle with with, with each other. Um, and as long as they're you know the technical infrastructure is there, right? The same basic mechanism that works for sovereigns could work for like large financial institutions, which could then, you know ultimately work for individuals, right? Especially if everyone's individual transactions have to be you know settled through some you know a handful of big financial counterparties. So that's like one version is like an ESDR, like CBDCs that function, you know, using, then they settle basically their reserve asset is, is an SDR. Um, and then there's like the Bitcoin plus stable coin scenario, right? Which could, 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 you know, these things aren't necessarily all mutually exclusive, right? You could see some monetization of gold. You could see an increasing relative importance of SDRs. You could see development further of CBDCs. And maybe the, the you know, in, you know cross-linking CBDCs, and then maybe the insertion of SDRs, you know, as a reserve asset that starts to take some of the collateral role away from treasury securities. And you can see the rise of private stablecoin issuance, and you can see the rise of, of a monetized Bitcoin. And so it's just like you know, that you could just sort of see these different threads evolving. And it's, I don't think it's like one will like win, and then that just is proceeding. And like they're all happening. We see them all play out in different ways, and they're all gonna like. Inter, inter, intersect with each other uh and so that's yeah and that's sort of where i sort of see this decade is a lot of those nascent threads right now bitcoin just recently becoming like relative like even relevant on, on that sort of monetary stage right it wasn't relevant yeah. before 2020 so it's just basically a brand new entrant right now you have to like all right well how how, how that's going to play out these things don't happen overnight they take years yes to, um uh, so yeah, that's that's why I'm gonna just 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 charting all those different potential paths. I mean, that is that is a very like, I I, I totally agree with that framework because like all of this macro stuff, it, it is you're not you're not predicting the future. You're you're assigning probabilities to various outcomes, and you're kind of looking at the signposts along the way, going, hey. Uh, this has just increased the probability of this sort of outcome. This has just increased the the, the probability of this sort of outcome. Uh, so, I mean, that that's a very, very logical framework uh, to my mind. So I guess moving toward the Bitcoin thing. Mm -hmm. So like you said, Bitcoin plus stable coins. So like, how do you, because one of the things I struggle most with, with Bitcoin, is that it was designed in such a way as to favor being a store of value and because of that declining issuance of new bitcoins as as the um you know basically every four years they do the halving then there's 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 fewer bitcoins coming out of the market and so that has sort of like instantiated this this desire for for participants to hodl <laughs> and that is to me dangerous to bitcoin's ability to become a medium of exchange because the the nascent threat i see for for bitcoin is that that issuance schedule starts to eventually really hurt its ability to 
secure the network and to um, because as more and more people are hodling and, and the coins aren't moving, you aren't generating transaction fees and the security budget by way of the new issuance of coins is decreasing. And so I guess the, the thing that I struggle with is at what point do like, I guess, how, how do you see that playing out where it actually transitions to a, a something you can actually use as a medium of exchange? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's two ways I would address this. One is, sort of, it's important to sort of do scenario analysis. You try to reason what has to obtain, what has to be true in the world for a scenario to be stable, right? Or at least, you know, um, come to fruition, right? And then you can see, okay, what are those essentially success criteria, right? For that scenario, say of Bitcoin becoming a global reserve asset that denominates global trade. And if you want to add into the scenario that it becomes a global medium of exchange, right? That That is used to do more than just global, say, like settlement, but is actually used for um, typical commerce, right? That'd be like an additional criteria to lay on. And then you have to say, okay, well, what about the network and what about the economics of the network has to has to have succeeded for that scenario to be true? And then you get like, okay, well, well then what is the, like, what is our uh, degree of confidence of from here to that future state of those conditions manifesting, right? Like what would be the path to go from here to there? So like to find the end state, like define the criteria that, that would mean that end state occurs and then examine the probability of getting to that end state, right? There's multiple end states and those all have different paths and different probabilities. That's how I sort of think about it. So like that that end state of Bitcoin becoming say global medium of exchange and global store of value, like collateral settlement um, asset requires a lot of things, right? That don't exist today, right? It requires a lot of things that are currently uncertain becoming more certain, right? And the thing is you can look at, well, what are the things that we would, uh, want, want to see for that degree of uncertainty to eventually come down. It doesn't have to come down to like zero, right? Like people have a lot of uncertainty over the future of the treasury security and the future of the dollar, and yet it's still the global dominant monetary system, right? And maybe they never had all that like high, high uncertainty. It just has to be like the best alternative and has to come to a certain psychological threshold of, of, of certainty and then therefore like um, less volatility for what I would call like the social reification to occur, right? Because it's all about mutual expectations reinforcing each other and creating a stable equilibrium. That's the key, right? And the problem right now is the system we have is vulnerable to these um, bifurcations, right? In the, in the dynamics, right? Where the what were converging expectations become diverging expectations and the system breaks. So you have to look at, it's not just the technical mechanics of like this engineered money system, getting the right parameters to it. It's a social evolution, right? How do the aggregate belief systems of human beings accrete on top of the network to create a stable set of future expectations that manifest, right? That is like all money is, right? It's a it's an aggregation, accumulation, and then accretion of, of increasingly um, stable mutual expectations about the future, right? And then eventually those expectations become, uh, you know, so it's not entirely sort of web of, of mutual belief like there has to be something to anchor it, right gold isn't just just a rock right but it's people's mutual belief in the scarcity of gold the fact that we're not going to find an asteroid tomorrow that you know that it is as scarce as we think it is and that everyone believes that everyone else believes that that's going to be true tomorrow that allows people to function in a way that treats gold as money like that's the basic process of kind of um yeah i mean money gold. is is a meme yeah always so, has like, been I would apply the same analysis to, you know, with like these are very technical, complex systems with a lot of institutional infrastructure and incumbent power and existing rules and regulatory frameworks and policies that like layer on top of like that endogenous kind of social story. But that's like the basic mechanisms. You have to see converging expectations and that like that itself, right, then manifests in the things that would solve that problem, right? Like if you have that stability of future expectations that eventually converges, then, you know, one of the things that has to happen, you have to reach saturation adoption, right? Which whatever portion of, of the global population that you're, you know, expecting to be a part of a global economy, right? it doesn't have to be everyone, but it has to be a sufficient uh, sort of threshold. Um, and if that adoption, you know, reaches saturation, then future volatility starts to converge because the uncertainty bounds about future, uh, future adoption by definition have converged to, you know, the growth rate of the human population. And so the uh, uncertainty over the future value of Bitcoin is likely to converge to, say global productivity changes. Um, so yeah, that brings me to something that I, I was just about to go to volatility because yeah. um, 
there's this like uh, there was a chart that I saw the other day, um, and I I can't remember if I have it on here or not. Um, just Ben, before you before you move on to that, I've just got just in terms okay. of this game of chess that that matters. Essentially, you've you've laid out a game of chess. That's the way that I see it. Is that you've got all these scenarios. You've you've obviously done calculated assumptions based on, you know, if this happens, then the result of that would be this. Um, my only issue is, I mean, I, I completely agree with the the fundamentals of what Bitcoin brings to the table. Like as a as the separate like like autonomous monetary network that that ultimately, I mean. All three of us know it's it, it is an incredible network that, if it's put to the devices of what it was intended to do, irrespective of whether we have emissions or not. I think, in terms of Ben, your question around emissions and the lack thereof, I think through the value of Bitcoin as a network, I think we can override that that potential problem. I know that it's a concern that you've had, and I do believe that by by its sheer value of say a hundred trillion dollars, I think there will be a solution in place to address that. My only concern and my question ultimately around Bitcoin that has troubled me for many years is that despite it being so fundamentally incredible to, to, to take care of these problems of essentially a neutral party to oversee what money is, mm -hmm. would the incumbents and those that are currently running the show actually accept the, the relinquishment... Re, relinquishing that power and handing it over to an autonomous organization that isn't an organization that is bitcoin and that is ultimately my question and my concern around this whole thing yes so political capture right to what extent does bitcoin remain this entirely um autonomous sort of you know, individual peer-to-peer -peer money system and to what extent could it be captured right could it be selectively captured right this is a big question and there's a mathematician um oh god i'm totally blanking on his name um i'll send it to you uh who's, who's, who's writing a book on bitcoin and game theory it's a technical treatise uh, uh akeem warner um and uh I, I read a few of his early chapters it's a great book it's very technical just like and he's a game theorist right and so he's, he's trying to model uh you know alternative scenarios for bitcoin's adoption and the kind of the different game theory you know either instability or stability conditions for uh, for that type of game, right? And it's a complex multiplayer game, right? It's like, you really get it. It's, like, it's a whole book, multiple chapters, a lot of detail, technical game theory. Um, and even that, right? He, he's like hedging and looks at lots of different kind of conditions. So there's no, I don't think like obvious answer to this question, but that's that's what you need to look at. You need to look at the game theory of it because it's an incentive-based system, right? And like to your question, right? The question is of incentives, right? Existing incumbent power systems, what is their incentives? Is it going to be to, and what is that, how is that calculus going to change? And even if they have the incentives, okay, well then what does that result in, right? Because just having an incentive as one actor in a system doesn't mean that they have veto power potentially, right? Um, it can under certain conditions. You might assume that that gives them veto power. It may not, right? Um, history is replete of examples of power centers not having as much power as they thought they did and Power is a fickle thing, right? Power is a matter of belief. Power, power is a matter of, of mutually reinforcing dynamics that sometimes can become mutually destructive. And so I, I, I think if people project too much to the future about sort of the, the current status of those of that current sort of you might call political economy of the monetary system. Um, but it is a is a key question, right? Because yes, like Bitcoin is not going to monetize in a vacuum. It's going to monetize up and through existing political structures. And that's what I, a lot of work I do with the Bitcoin Policy Institute, which is sort of the side side thing I support, is exactly this. It is it is engaging directly with policymakers and sort of the larger kind of policy debate about Bitcoin specifically and Bitcoin's relationship to U.S. national security. And I sort of made arguments that, in fact, like at least under a reasonable time horizon, like Bitcoin's monetization is better for the United States than the alternative things it could monetize. Right. Like you do not want a reserve asset to be, uh, you know, in the hands, principally in your adversary, like gold, right? Uh, so if that, if like the Luke Roman thesis played out, that'd be like a rebalancing of global power that would advantage, say, Russia, China, India, um, most of most of our kind of like Eurasian adversaries. Uh, India is, you know, obviously a balancing power, but um, they would win. Turkey would win. We would net lose. So like these dynamics, right, have geopolitical implications and. Strategic national decision makers might want to bet everything That's on the U.S. Treasury market, right? But, but my thesis then is okay. Yes, like we've like we've 
really just squeezed everything we can. Like we're really maxed out on our financial power right now. And it, it, you feel really good when like, you're just like swinging sanctions around and like people just have to like, you know, scurry to avoid your almighty dollar, dollar weapon. And that makes you feel a lot really powerful and strong. And you think that's going to inevitably uh, endure, right? My, my point has been is like, you know, you should always plan, right? Plan for the worst, <laughs> right? Like plan that that instrument of national power be, you know, isn't as maximally effective over time. And you need to have backup plans. You need to have a hedge. Like what if there's instability structurally in this treasury market? What if our adversaries increase their hedging power? What if global surpluses start to be rebalanced away from, 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 from Western assets? What if like an alignment between commodity producers and global production geopolitically try to take down the Western financial system? Like these would be big problems for US national security, hedging everything on US treasury market, maybe not the best idea, Having Bitcoin monetized relative to say what they're trying to have monetized is a strategic, it's like, like you know, hedge. That you and and we hold the most Bitcoin, so if Bitcoin were monetized, we would stand to gain disproportionately to our adversaries. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like a near-term tactical play. It doesn't change your question as like this long term, right? Like thirty years from now, if Bitcoin was like the global money. What does that mean to states? That's like the Pol Balaji network state thesis. Do we go to an entire different pattern of political arrangement? Does Bitcoin become the locus and driver of an alternative system of governance that's like truly peer to peer? That's like, you know, this grand revolution in human social relations and like the Westphalian state concept that was created, you know, under certain material economic conditions that required vertically integrated bureaucratic control structures just breaks down. And we have this sort of neo Pax digital, you know, civilization. I don't know, but that's like 30, 40 years from now. I have no idea how that happens or how we get there. But like, that's what you're talking about, right? Is like just fundamental breakdown or restructuring of the pattern of global politics and centers of power being redistributed, being moved around. I don't know, you know, like power likes power, but like not power doesn't always get what it, get what it wants, right? Like this is the thing. Well, so this is, this is, uh, but you're right. Like it's not inevitable. I certainly would grant that. Bitcoin is not like just guaranteed to become the global money like with with like in 15 years or whatever right put it to put a dot on the map and say you know that's like, refreshing to hear I, that easy, is a, that right? is a refreshing take <laughs> i just you know like you know, the world is contingent right? I, history is is weird but what that's, i like what i really like about the, the the different approaches that the two of you have taken is that matt it's it's very obvious that that you are essentially this eternal chess player you're obviously seeing different scenarios different moves and it's been very interesting to see how it is a hedging game. It is an understanding of, you know, if this if this scenario happens, what's behind it, what's to its side, left or right, up and down. Um, but at the same time, what I like about your perspective is that it isn't naive to think that, you know, like a lot of maxis do, is that it's kind of like, well, it's it's either this or that. And it's never that. It's never about that. And it's it's always about a measured perspective around what is going on more importantly, what's going on right now, because that's what ultimately has brought us here is like there's the shit storm that's currently going on and it's significant. Obviously, there's shit storms all the time, but right now we have an especially big one or many big ones and we're just trying to make sense of it. And I really appreciate the fact that it's not just about one or the other. There's different scenarios. We need to be aware of them and then we need to obviously go into them with our eyes wide open, you know, and, you know, obviously, Ben, in terms of your volatility question, I'm sorry that I hijacked the whole thing. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to, to lead into that, though, because like this, this sort of kind of plays into what we were just discussing here where you, you have these all these various players, right? You have all these global players. And the thing that that to me is the most compelling case for Bitcoin is the fact that is this neutral settlement asset and like you said if if we if um china has to choose between investing in more u.s treasuries and more more of the ability to of the the u.s to exert dominance and control over them or invest in some other neutral settlement asset at the margin they're going to choose the neutral settlement asset and and that goes for basically every player that isn't the U.S. is is going to at the margin if they have to choose between, uh, or at least have some sort of hedge for do dollar hegemony, they're going to go to the deepest, most liquid, neutral settlement asset. And so, the 
the that liquidity really i mean that is that is the the constant for for settlement or for um any sort of asset that that gains sufficient liquidity will gain adoption because like liquidity and adoption it 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 has its own network effects that are that are inherent to it like there's this whole notion that like you know everybody uses the dollar just because uh, you know, somebody made a deal with the Saudis back in the 70s and the, uh, you know, because they price oil in dollars, now everybody has to use the dollar. But it's not really that. It's that the Saudis had to unload a shit tons of, of oil into the market. And you don't want to do that in a currency that can't take the, the price impact of, of making those trades every day for millions of barrels of oil. And so if if Bitcoin is able to to achieve sufficient levels of liquidity just by being neutral, then you know that's very very damn bullish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to see that kind of um, flywheel take take shape, right? Um, and it is, you know, in, in early stages, right? It's subject to massive uncertainty, right? Like everyone gets super optimistic, the flywheel is happening now. And then everyone tries to front one the fly like that front, that flywheel dynamic, and it turns out actually it hasn't happened yet. All that was just mutual front running. And then once people become you know disillusioned, then it flips, and you get the typical boom and bust cycle, right? So I think you know you know liquidity right is this is not a one way ticket, right? But that's like a necessary ratchet you have to kind of click through to get to larger and larger pools of capital that are sort of institutionally gated, right? It's not just like free flowing money that just like finds the best return in you know, the sort of optimal world. It is like very heterogeneous, isolated, gar walled gardens of different you know, pools of, of capital that has very different uh, institutional constraints and, and objectives. Um, it's like, yeah, sovereign wealth funds and, you know, FX reserve managers and insurance companies and pensions and, you know, like lay out the gamut. They all have a different framework and different constraints and they may see the benefits of Bitcoin differentially over time. But to your point, like it just requires like, you know, this sort of marginal, you know, incremental um, uh, adoption, small percentage points over time, increasingly opening up those pools of capital that, you know, increases its liquidity, which makes it more attractive as an asset, decreases its volatility, et cetera. That's, that's the, That'd be the bullish yes. piece there, right? Liqui and, um, and, and, and to go to the back to that volatility thing. So the deeper the liquidity, and, and that is really, that is really the, it's the inverse. Liquidity is like the inverse of volatility. Mm -hmm. And so as that liquidity increases, Bitcoin will become less volatile. And, and you're already starting to see that. Like there was the chart I was, I was talking about earlier is that it was like the, the volatility of gilt versus <laughs> The, which is, are the British bonds for those yeah. that, that aren't steeped in this every day. Um, the, the volatility of British bonds has exceeded that of Bitcoin mm -hmm. over the last, I don't know how many months. But like, the yeah. point is that like, as that volatility wanes, it becomes more attractive. And so yeah. it becomes this self-reinforcing network effect that, that just liquidity begets liquidity begets liquidity and then pretty soon oh now you've got yourself an actual reserve asset that the world can use not necessarily a global reserve currency but a, a, at least a viable reserve asset yeah and so this is quite complicated because it's yes I, I that is that is a key part of the story there's another part of the story which is like the use of it as an actual settlement mechanism, right? Because there's people who just buy it and hold it, shrink the finites, you know, like like float, and then eventually people just, you know, their purchasing power increases with, with, with respect. But it, that that story doesn't necessarily mean that there's use of it to set up a national trade, right? That would be like the next phase, right? Like you first have to get a certain degree of liquidity, a certain degree of stability, a certain degree of consensus over future expectations that converges uncertainty, that brings down volatility, that then creates um you know that counterparty trust level to then use it as a settlement layer but that's then you know th that's an open question to me is the demand for centers of resistance is a spectrum right and it's ge geopolitically contingent and it's entity and jurisdictionally dependent right not everyone needs a center of resistant transaction medium all the time and so mm -hmm. the question is under what future conditions in what jurisdictions with what pools of capital would that be 
demanded, right, with respect to alternatives, right? Whether those alternatives still exist or not is, you know, an open question you throw in this scenario. But the question is, would you rather use a SWIFT to, you know, settle settle your your bank to bank transfers, or would you use the Bitcoin network? And it it could be a matter of like Bitcoin's liquidity is so large, and the transaction fees for large settlements are so low. And with a Lightning Network for small batch payments, it might even be cheaper. It could just be economically cheaper to use Bitcoin's rails, right? That's an open question. That's like the Jack Mahler's thesis for cross-border settlements is that it's just going to be economically cheaper to do it this way because correspondent banking system, especially for cross-border uh, transactions, is really expensive and inefficient. And it doesn't look like, you know, this ESDR, Global Crossbridge CBDC with FedNow, blah, 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 is all that innovative or anywhere, or, or anywhere close. So, like... There's the just pra pra practical argument of just, well, yeah. these, these real-time payment systems are just slow and they're just like not innovative. And hey, look, there's just going to be this emerging, you know, whether there's going to be other, other things like that that could emerge too. That's like one argument is that just, it just is cheaper, it's more efficient, and it just gets adopted for that very reason. You know, that's like a different dynamic, right? You have to throw in on terms of the assumptions. Um, I could see that's plausible and not rely entirely on just like the censorship resistance sort of premium, right? People are willing to pay more to have their transaction you know not be at the whim um and so you have to hold the asset to have that access we don't have to actually hold like as much as you would need right because that's like your global savings like you hold bitcoin as a right that and then that's a very different um you know uh you know objective than using the network to conduct a central resistance for a transaction and then there's the geopolitical question which is how much centers of resistance will that actively entail right this you have to make other auxiliary assumptions about what is left of the fiat reserve system, right? That 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 is not in commerce because it's always those is those intersections. It's going to be the boundary layers between the Bitcoin system and the legacy uh, fiat system. Where the power is going to be the most, um, the most uh, you know uh, applied, right? It's like you can do like you know this. Folks in the White House are just like, wait, can't you just stop a Bitcoin transaction? Like, no. But they're like, well, we don't really have to. We don't really care. We just like you can play in your Bitcoin world, but when it comes into a financial institution, that's when we have the panopticon. That's when we have the control. So if you want to come in or out of the Bitcoin world, you know you got to go through us, basically. That's that's yeah. that is how the power system tries to corral Bitcoin. Not as, not by doing a fifty-one percent attack and getting all it's the just, miners. It's, it's ring fenced with KYC yeah. and that's, that's, all that. that that is the battle playing out right now is it's trying to ring fence it and trying to gate it and then, you know, ultimately make it so that you just get your Bitcoin custody with Bank of New York Mellon, which custodies everyone else's treasury securities. And it just is like a different label on your account. Right. That's like the that'd be like the depressing kind of thesis of just like, you know, most money. It just, you know, it just sort of uh, reaches an inertia and, you know, the the this incipient peer to peer money system. You know, it just, just you know, sort of decays. Um, that's that that could happen, right? People ultimately are, are lazy and um, don't run a node, right? So it's like how, you have to kind of you know think about different conditions for the network to expand from you know a few million nodes to you know several hundred million nodes, right? Um, and what are the material incentives and things like block and what you know TBD or whatever are doing? And so I think that to me is I know there's so much innovation. This thing is still very new, like 13 years, like and even then it's like geopolitically relevant, like the last two um like yeah. and like the pace of change not just in bitcoin but across this entire digital asset ecosystem is so dramatic that like i it's uh, it's daunting. what this looks like what this looks like in 2030 right like does anyone have a clue i don't think so so i you know if you don't have any clue about what it like technically can look like in 2030 what other um sorts of capabilities are built in um and how how this plays out not just in the west but in the global south um yeah, I mean, my like more optimistic kind of vision of this is like the Treasury Securities Global Reserve Asset has an implicit power dynamic because only like big institutions really hold treasuries, right? Like just like gold was naturally concentrated and concentratable, right? Like it was held up in vaults in central institutions, and then that became like a basis for issuing claims against it. And that's why mostly gold fails because people just issue more claims than they have gold. Um, the Treasury Securities, like, and that's, that's why our dollar system uh, based on gold kind of broke down right with the nixon shock um and then instead we just have treasury securities but that's basically the same thing here's like a really special piece of paper not even that it's a special claim that's on a computer system that is being run by a bunch of large like institutions around the world so it's like essentially concentrates access to the global reserve asset like handful of like pension people you know pensioners can hold a treasury but they're like you know 
their pension fund holds it at a major custodian. Like a Bitcoin is a reserve asset for the people, right? That's like a different paradigm where like a lot of emerging markets who want to don't, don't have access to good stores of wealth have to hold it in, you know, like a shanty town, right? Have to hold it in like literal bricks, right? They put next to their house because that's like that's like essentially the most like stable source of wealth is people need to build build homes. So they just accumulate bricks to build their own house. So like most money systems around the world are really dysfunctional and most people don't have any access to anything like like a store of value. Um, and then what they do have is like terrible for, for the purposes. And Bitcoin is not great as a store of value right now, obviously, especially if your time horizons is like six months. But, but it's better like, than nothing. <laughs> well, yeah. And, you know, and then you can imagine a scenario where it just, you know, like again, like it's not great if it just stays at $19,000 for the next 10 years, right? But so you don't want like volatility to disappear. Um, but like you want there to be at least um, convergence over time that goes with monetary appreciation and that people that hold it in, in the developing world have access to an asset that's like harder for the central government to seize. And, you know, that they can, you know, in mobile first environments as they start to develop digitally, this gives, you know, new, new possibilities for economic development. That's like, you know, more speculative and, you know, that's more, you know, I don't know how, 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 how likely that is, but like, that's a new possibility that didn't exist a few years ago. Um, and yeah, like, I think these things are just like, they create more questions for, for, um, you know, for thinking how, how things could evolve. Like, great, you know, we've had a lot of pessimism, right? But, like, this, yeah. is, this is why, like, when I think about Bitcoin, I'm slightly more optimistic, right? Like, I think people, I, like, in the gold community, right? Like, I'm not a gold bug, I never really was one, but, like, yeah. the reason why, like, it's kind of got this reputation is because, like, they have to basically see the end of the world happen, right, for their thesis to play out, which is kind of, like, makes you just not a very, like, good conversationalist, right? <laughs> like, like uh, and so I, I, I don't think Bitcoin needs to have the world fall apart for it to succeed, right? Like, uh in fact like it's kind of somewhat leveraged to there being a global internet right there being somewhat of a global system so there are some yeah. things, like that breaks down where like we just you know we, we fry each other and you know bitcoin is all that not that useful there so um in that sense like bitcoin has made a little has a little more of an optimistic take on how you know patterns of human civilization could evolve uh than, i than guess the old idea I know that, that we're running out of time here so i I'll, I'll leave you with this this last question and that is like I guess why is Bitcoin not susceptible to the same issues of claims against it like gold is? Because to me, it seems like all the financialization mm -hmm. that's happening, and and some of this is just so. I generally tend to tend to focus like most of my attention on the Ethereum world, um, but like I guess. There's there's so much going on in that world of of kind of rebuilding the the fiat <laughs> financial rails yeah. in 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 the uh, you know blockchain space. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question about Bitcoin is: Is it going to have the sufficient ability to to expand and contract the economy the same way as? Um, as as you could with with a sort of uh, more financialized version of of the future that you kind of see what it would look like in Ethereum right now, where you can you can do all sorts. There's all sorts of like way, ways of uh, creating derivatives and things mm -hmm. in that that world. And the the thing that I always take issue with with Bitcoin is it's like it's so. It, it, it is so guarded about its ability to stay the same mm -hmm. that it, it makes it less useful from a financial aspect. Um, and if, if you lose that ability to expand and contract your economy, then you end up with that same problem where you have a whole bunch of people making claims on collateral that end up with the same sort of boom and bust spot cycles we see now where you have claims on on federal reserve assets in the euro dollar system that that blow up when everything contracts because all of that leverage has to unwind so yeah so thinking about like a hypothetical future like bitcoin economy where we we pass through all the gauntlet and we have a world that uses bitcoin like what could be used on bitcoin that's similar to our current sort of um set of financial uh, kind of transactions that rely on sort of uh, elasticity of credit claims, right? And how much elasticity of credit claims would a Bitcoin-based monetary 
regime enable? Uh, what extent would, those, would that elasticity be enabled just by virtue of the monetary regime is one question. The other question is like the technical capacity of the Bitcoin protocol and associated you know, protocol you know, developments in the far future, right? So Ethereum, like that's more of a protocol level question, right? Like to what extent is the protocol with, with smart contracts, you know, enable these types of derivatives like, like, like products being built, you know, directly on, you know, yeah, the Ethereum blockchain versus, you know, it's some um, side chain or whatever on, on Bitcoin. That's like a technical question could require you know, future protocol changes. I don't know how much Taproot really enables this or things like Tarot. These are the kind of more speculative things, but I don't know. That's like a protocol technical question. You know, it's like, can you do it? Right. The question is, would like more like the, like the economic question of just like, when you have a hard money asset, how much credit elasticity can be, you know, can that support? Um, as you saw this with gold, the reason my gold fails because people wanted to have more than there was. Right. And so they created fictions and then they traded those fictions as if they were the real thing. And, you know, you got this boom and bust, right? That's sort of basic human nature, right? Part of human nature, part of it's all the institutional framework, right? The custodians and the issuers of those claims and the regulatory environment that either provides an imprimatur or backstop for those claims and then regulates the issuance of those claims or not. And that's, so it's not really purely a Bitcoin question. It's a question of the like policy, regulatory and social framework that evolves around Bitcoin. And I think in general, like hard money assets make it, psychologically harder to expand credit elasticity as much as you can when you can just like do collateral transformation on just garbage you know securities and treat them like money but like people do that because they can make money with it and people are greedy and they'll do it with rap bitcoin they'll do it with you know bitcoin cdos right whatever right like people are creative and do all sorts of crazy ponzi stuff um you're not going to stop that right it's really ultimately a, um, a question of how much like how easy is it to call in that collateral, right? Like when you want it, right? When it's gold, it's really hard to go and collect your collateral and there's really not much you can do with it after you've taken it. You just not this bar of gold, right? Yeah, Bitcoin, now you gotta you know, pay somebody to guard it. <laughs> yeah, like the callability of the collateral and the essentially automation that you can have for that, potentially like that creates an incentive dynamic to, you know, cause it, like, like as we've seen with BlockFi, as we've seen with Celsius, like, oh wait, when you, when you try to play these rehypothecation games with Bitcoin, you, you go out of business basically pretty soon. So like, I see this as like a Darwinian process where like the institutions, the people that try to rehypothecate and create, you know, like le leverage claims against, against Bitcoin eventually get blown up. And then eventually people realize that's not a great thing to do. And there's some equilibrium that gets established. It's like, this is kind of a safe level of, hypo of rehypothecation. And then here's the say proof of assets, proof of reserves that we will do to like market signal that we've got what we have. Yep. You don't need to come in and, and, and call those back uh, and do a, do a run on us. So, you know, essentially these are shadow banks basically, right? Yeah, I um, mean, but it it's a more stable yeah. system. It's 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 akin to to the the fire, letting the, the wildfire burn down the, the brush in the in the forest rather than like getting, letting all that brush build up and then completely taking out the forest permanently. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's where we are right now is we are, we are in the for forest full of brush <laughs> and leverage and, and waiting, waiting for the, the flames to take us. Yeah, yeah, surely, exactly. Surely, surely if there is an intrinsic value that is established, I mean, obviously we could argue that nothing has intrinsic value, but let's assume that, we all agree that that Bitcoin is is a, has a certain standard and it has its place in whatever scenario we paint. I mean, we, we look at this game of chess. We assume that it's worth something. It doesn't matter from my perspective and my understanding, Ben. Just coming back to to what it is that you asked, it's almost like the way that I see it and the way that you explained it, Matt, is that it doesn't really matter whether it's the Ethereum network, whether it's the fiat system. It doesn't matter what system the delivery is on. If we accept that there's value and that there is a basis for collateral to be called upon, and if we assume that it is Bitcoin in this instance, if we find solutions according to the Web3 standard and whether Bitcoin facilitates that from a technical level, which I'm not technically orientated, just making the assumption, I don't really believe that, 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 that it really matters what the delivery is. I don't believe and that the road to... To financial nirvana is only Bitcoin. It could be Ethereum, it could be Polygon, it could be something that hasn't been created yet. As long as we have 
an understanding and a belief that what it is that we are entrusting our money in or that we understand what money is. And hopefully it is Bitcoin because I do see the value of it in that sense. Then I think we're good to go, gentlemen. You know, that's the I, way that I'm seeing it. That, Completely that's what optimistic I'm taking now. from this too. Yeah, that's, totally, that's, you know. that's what I'm taking from this conversation as well, is that you're right. It is, I, I really appreciate that you took the, the distinction between a technical hurdle versus a th that that mimetic belief that it has value is is entirely separate from any sort of technical hurdles that 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 might exist and, and that's, there are, and 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 that's to, the problem that's the problem and you've got like the bitcoin maxis fighting and you got the ethereum maxis fighting and you got all these people fighting actually over the same thing because <laughs> there isn't just one highway, guys. It's like there's there's multiple highways, and they could go to the same destination. That's the well, way I like see a, it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's like a you call it like a, a monetary reformation, like the Protestant Reformation, and there were factions, right? And there were somewhat arcane disputes because human beings are social creatures, and part of the mimetic process of any new social belief is creating and finding an optimal balance between. Um, Sort of, the, I think of like any any emerging social phenomena. You could call it like an open monetary network. You can call it a new religious movement, new political movement, a new like you know fad or whatever uh, that has like some internal coherence to its mutual belief system and group identity. And then there's some you know barrier between that group identity that defines it as a group and the external group world that's by definition not a part of that group, right? And the the question is as the group expands, you know, essentially, you know, converts people, things that were outside that, that barrier to inside that barrier, it's a function of how permeable that barrier is. And so you can see like degrees of maxiness are degrees of belief about how permeable that barrier be like, like, like a cell, right? If a cell has, has like no permeability, it dies because it can't get nutrients and can't grow, can't replicate. But if it's too permeable, if it has no real defined identity and there's no, there's no one defining that identity, then it goes through apoptosis. It dies. It loses its. It loses its identity. It just disintegrates into the ether. And so, any stable, expanding uh, social phenomena, which I would say the Bitcoin network is, and any open monetary network that has the sort of same same dynamics, has to find the right you know a value parameter to set for the permeability of the membrane, right? And that's the fight: is should it be the Maxi's super vanguard that says no, this is it. You have to pass the shibboleth. You have to pass the litmus test to come into this. To come into this and when you're growing like this is the dynamic right like you always gonna have the dogmatic like sort of canonical adherence that like keep the flame that's like this is bitcoin and this will never change and you kind of need that right because you need that sort of locus to basically you know sort of create that kind of concrete anchor right but if everyone was like that then they would get then you would get no conversions right because very very rarely do people convert from non-believers to true believers instantly right there's a conversion process and so there's just in any social phenomenon, there has to be people along that spectrum. And, you know, that's the fights you see. This is like the open and this is the process, right? Like there is there is there is a social scenario where that fails, where like and you've seen this in like some movements where they succeed at bootstrapping beyond a certain point, attracted to a certain very narrow subset of sort of predisposed psychological types and ideological types. And then they saturate among that tiny subset and then they max out and then they find very little to you know expand beyond right the ideology the the social um conversion process can't uh, adapt and expand and therefore you know the group and the associated sort of network doesn't adapt and expand like that's a failure mode that wouldn't be a technical failure mode just be an ideological failure mode that's like that's the argument against sort of bitcoin maxiness but the other argument is that if you don't have those people sort of in the tent that are like in, at least enforcing some standards right that's like here it is. It's 21 million, right? Like this is the this is the this is the this is the canon. Then you don't have a coherent Bitcoin, right? Um, you get disputes and you get and you get forks, right? You get you get you get uh, Bitcoin Cash. You get you know we get these things, right? So okay, so I I yeah. I commit I commit from this day forward to appreciate the existence of Bitcoin Maxis, <laughs> even though I do believe that I am a Bitcoin Maxi, but at heart. Um, I will appreciate them more for the very reasons that you stated, and I completely agree with you, hundred percent. Yep, that is that is very, very aptly put. Very nice. Well, 
do you think, think we should call it here? I mean, we've been going at this, this for really two hours. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's going to go awesome. on forever. Yeah, this, there's really no <laughs> possible, yeah. yeah there, there is no end to this stuff, but this has been an, a phenomenal discussion. So uh, yeah, I absolutely great. appreciate you being here, Matt. Yeah, thanks for having me. I uh, have to do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I will be uh, hitting you up to do this again at, at some point for sure, because uh, th there's so much more that that has yet to be said. But uh, I think I think we covered uh, like a, a nice breadth of, of topics that I that I wanted to hit with you. So uh, let's go ahead and call it there. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for coming on to the Blockmate stream. Um, Wow, we, we never thought we'd actually have a serious one, but this was pretty <laughs> serious, even though we did manage to to have a couple of laughs. And yeah, thanks for, for beautifully kind of painting this this game of chess that's currently obviously playing out at the moment and obviously shedding light on, you know, it's not about obs obsoletes or absolutes. It's about many different scenarios. And let's let's come back to this discussion at a later stage and, yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you.